Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for this opportunity to teach your word, Lord. I pray that I would be spirit-filled, Lord, and that your words would go forward, Lord, and that, um, Lord, that it would impact our hearts, Lord, and, and help us to see the glory of following you, Lord, um, and see, Lord, your work at hand, Lord, and, and the joy that comes along with being a part of what it is that you're doing, Lord. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, while I was studying this passage, I was thinking, or reminded, rather, uh, of my... Oh, how do I say it? My testimony in growing up in a in a Christian home, um, I I identified rather closely with this story. Uh, this man, this rich young ruler, and the the system that he found himself in. See, I grew up in a Christian home, and although it wasn't exclusively a legalistic environment, um, there were legalistic tendencies. That was the culture that my parents had come out of. And what I mean by that is, is what was caught rather than taught was a, a system of do's and don'ts. And that led to the appearance of what was considered to be righteous rather than the reality that none are righteous. And much like the pharisaical system that this man finds himself, it was an environment that for the longest time left me conflicted and confused about my own salvation how that looked. And although I had taken the steps to, to be saved, um, confessing my sin and, and following Jesus, asking Jesus to be my personal Savior, I still felt no joy in walking with the Lord under that system. You know, it was a burdensome. It was impressive. It was a system that always demanded more, and it didn't leave you with any hope. And often it led me to ask the same question that this young man asks, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, and to begin, we'll, we'll look at some context here um, about what's taking place here, just like, because um, we are still in chapter 19, as we were last week, and Jesus is still continuing his journey down through Judea, as we learned last week, the week before. And the parables before and leading up to this passage have been in reference to the kingdom of heaven, particularly in reference to those who enter the kingdom. And as Sam taught us last week, there were large crowds going along the same road as Jesus. Some were following, some weren't. And they're making the same journey as Jesus to Jerusalem for the purpose of Passover. And like Sam pointed out, we're just weeks away from the crucifixion. And as we see here, Jesus is just getting up to, to leave that the children that he was with and were called to switch scenes. The word here, behold is to call our attention to a detail, to emphasize a point within the narrative. So as Jesus is getting up and going away to continue his journey, behold, he's approached by a young man. And what we know about this man is that he is very wealthy. Not just monetarily, but in possession and position as well. Most likely, considering the culture of the day, this is a uh, family or inherited wealth. So it's an estate that he is managing. And in Luke 18, 18, the parallel account of this parable, we see also that he is a ruler. MacArthur suggests maybe a ruler of a synagogue. So he's a religious man. And from verse 22, we see he's a young man, you know, maybe between 20 and 40 years of age, probably leaning maybe a little older for some of us who want to still feel like we're young. 
<laughs> but age not being the particular point here, but rather that this man up to this point has made all the right moves in a relatively short amount of time to get to where he is today and seemingly has it all, this man does. And he still has half his life left. Well, to begin looking at this encounter that we see between this young man and Jesus, we begin reading in 16, And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said to him, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what do I lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. See, the issue here in verse 16 is salvation and how to obtain eternal life. The word eternal is not merely a quantitative length of time that this young man is after, but a quality of life that this man is, is after. This is a quality that brings peace and assurance, confidence and satisfaction, and rest when the Spirit of God moves in a person. This is a quality that this man is not experiencing, despite the position of his current circumstances. See, he has obtained a great deal in his life, but for all his accomplishments, there is a void that he can't fill. And he has surely heard of the miraculous things that Jesus has been doing along the road. And undoubtedly, he has heard the teaching in the previous parables. And he is recognizing in his own life that he doesn't have it. This thing of eternal life, this quality of life. He's a man of desperation. The parables or the parallels of these of this story is in Mark and in Luke. And when you put them together, you get a you get a, a complete picture. And Mark tells us that he ran and he knelt before Jesus. So you can imagine he pushed through the crowds to get to Jesus. He sees him and he gets there. This is a man who recognizes for all his efforts to please God, there is something missing, and he recognizes enough about Jesus to approach him for a possible answer. Do I think he thinks he's God? No. But he asks the question, good teacher, as Luke tells us, good teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit life? And the term good that he addresses Jesus, that he he. Uh, what is it, prescribes Jesus in the title as Jesus isn't, um, as Jesus addresses that title. Good? You call me good? Only God is good. And what he's saying here is he is higher than what he has recognized as his other teachers. You see, nobody in, in the rabbinical system would ascribe themselves this title of good. So, so he does recognize enough about Jesus that he is more than what he has been getting. And in Jesus' response, he's not saying that he isn't good or that he isn't good enough to speak to these things or, or giving up any of his deity, but rather he is saying, by your own profession, you call me good. If God is only good in assigning this title to me, you should have no problem listening to what I have to speak on this matter. That's what he's saying. And he's going to hold him to it. He's going to hold his feet to the fire. 
His encounter continues, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. In verse 18, the man replies, which ones? Jesus said, again, the list of commandments, you shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, steal, bear false witness. You should honor your father, mo father and mother, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And he, he says, all these I've kept, and what do I still lack? And I, when I first came across that, I thought, well, that, that's bold. That's an audacious statement. This is Jesus we're talking about. You run to Jesus and you say, you've done all these things. Are you perfect? No. I mean, this guy should surely understand that. Does he think he's perfect in the law? What does he still lack? He asks the question. But I don't think it's an arrogant. I don't think he comes at it with arrogance. I think this man is a little confused and conflicted himself, as I was describing earlier. You see, as far as, as he was concerned, he came looking for what was missing out of the system that he was under. Because to the best of his ability, he's been trying to keep the law. And I think he was coming here to Jesus to look, what's that one thing I've been missing? I've been doing it. I've been knocking it out of the park here. And I've got some position. I've got some power. I'm a moral man. I'm well-respected. I think, I'm, I think I've kept the law. I think I've done this. Luke says he's done it since he was, since his, his youth. And I think he's confused at this point. He came here looking for that, and he's given what he already knows. I think he was expecting that one thing, and he was hoping Jesus could give him. So he asked, what do I still lack? And Jesus tells him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. The man goes away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions. In Luke, he says, there is one thing you lack. Sell everything you go, God, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, come, follow me. See, this young man didn't come to Jesus to receive him. He came to find the one missing thing from his list, to affirm his righteousness. To affirm that thing that would allow him to remain as he is, and all that comes with it, in peace. That's what this man's lacking, peace. But it's a superficial seeking. You see, he's looking for justification from the law. However, the law can only make us sin known, not free us from sin, right? Romans 7, Paul tells us, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law didn't say, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Paul says, I once was alive apart from the law. And this is a position that I think this young man's in. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and died. And I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. You see, we don't have a speed limit to stop people from speeding. But rather the, the point to point out when people are. The law offers no salvation when it's transgressed. You stand there when you get caught, condemned, and you get a ticket. Likewise, the law, thou shalt not murder, does nothing to change the heart that hates his brother. Nor the law committing adultery for the heart that looks on a woman with lust. Jesus is pointing this man to a heart issue, you see. And we've heard leading up to this before the same thing over and over and over again. 
in Luke 14, 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Deny yourself and come after me. I've heard that over and over and over again. You see, this man was missing something. And what, how could he miss this? In well, 1 Corinthians 2.14, we see that, that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This challenge to the young man seemed foolish. How could he give up what he had? After all, there was a lot at stake. But to avoid being too quick to point out what this young man fails to see, we'll go ahead and look at Jesus' response to this whole encounter of his. Verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 24, again, I tell you, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were astonished, saying, who then can be saved? Now, from a human perspective, an earthly perspective, this is an astonishing declaration. This man, in his eyes and in the eyes of the community, is a righteous and moral man because of his position and possessions. You know, there's a suggestion of a connection between blessing and righteousness in this culture, and he couldn't have possibly obtained these circumstances without being in good standing with God. And surely, if anybody was to see this guy as a candidate for eternal life, surely it'd be him if they were looking for one. Surely this guy'd get in. So, Jesus takes this perception, being a religious and moral man, not obtaining eternal life, flips that perception on its head, and from that perspective they ask the question, who then can be saved? Well, and the Lord answers them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, natural man in his flesh cannot please God. We learn in Romans 8, 6 through 7, for to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And isn't that what this young man was after? Life and peace? He found a, a level of life in his pursuit of the law. And he didn't have any peace. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now Paul's conversion and testimony of faith, I think, is a great example of this. In Philippians 3, 4 through 7, Paul writes, If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. Zeal, persecuting the church. You see, everything in Paul's life that he had been working for under that system, he was knocking it out of the park. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. You see, this young man... It failed to understand two important things. The first, he failed to understand his condition before God. Romans 3 says, all have fallen short. There are none who are righteous. None who do good. No, not, not one. It is a condition of guilt and enmity with God, as all men 
are suffering. A condition that can only rely on righteousness earned under human effort and is as filthy rags before God. And without a proper perspective of his nature, he was unable to understand or, or realize the second thing, which is the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. And without that understanding in his flesh, he was unable to see the value of Christ's invitation to come and follow him. Well, so far, this seems to be going terribly for this guy. This, this is not a very encouraging story up until this point. This young man comes looking for the right thing. He's asking the right question. Eternal life, how do I get it? And he's asking the right person. And yet he leaves without obtaining the thing he was looking for. And we don't know anything much about the events of this man's life after this encounter, other than that he goes away sorrowful. There's nothing to say he couldn't have gotten saved. Of course, the opposite is true. The point, however, is to understand with what we do have here in knowledge of this is that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot have life in God and life in earthly possessions and priorities and pursuits. The word says you'll love the one and hate the other. You see, our natural desires, hopes, plans are all at enmity with God. And we all must count the cost, just like this young man. You know, those following that verse in the cost of discipleship in Luke that we had talked about of picking up your cross, denying yourself, picking up your cross and following me. We see the parable of the, of the man who goes to build a tower and of the man who goes to war. Just like those guys, we all have to count the cost and decide. Is Christ worthy? And next, Peter's question to Jesus here gives us a little bit of insight to answering that very question. Is Christ worthy? See, Peter said to Jesus in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Verse 20, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So we go back and we look at the challenge from Luke to deny everything and the, the proposition that Jesus gave this young man. At first glance, it might have seemed harsh. How could he ask so much? I mean, because there's no talk of grace or faith in this passage. It's all law. That seems harsh. But yet, isn't this the, the, the thing that he's pointing him to? The, the fact that he'd have to give up all the things that Jesus was asking him to give up? He's comparing his worth compared to the things of this world or to Jesus. What are you going to hold on to in comparison to me? And we see Christ's worth here. Everything, everyone who has left these things, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold. The parallel passage in Mark and Luke says, we'll receive a hundredfold in this lifetime, in this present time, and in the age to come, eternal life. So to answer the question, is Christ worth, worthy? Yes, Christ is worthy. He's far more than we could ever ask or think. 
To deny, you see, to deny ourselves in the pursuit of Christ is to deny less in favor for more. You see, this young man didn't understand that. All he could see was all the things that he could lose. And they were great. To make a decision to sell everything means not just selling everything, getting rid of his baggage, but is to give up everything that he had, his possession, his position. Like we said, it was a, it was a family estate that he was managing. He has family connected to what he, Jesus is asking him to sell. Their money ticket's going out the door if he follows through. I don't think that's going to make his family happy. <laughs> Their livelihood's leaving. Surely he would lift up his, he would lose his position in the synagogue. So all of his reputation would be gone. His possession would be gone. That's a big thing, but not in comparison to following Jesus. So what do we learn, and what, what does it mean? We met a young man who is, who is a product of a legalistic system and his natural self. We saw the enticement, how the enticement of wealth, which comes with position and power and influence, can be a powerful and seductive force that can keep men and women from experiencing the fullness of joy and life offered through following Christ. But we also saw that however difficult it may be to do, what is impossible with us is possible with, with God, the salvation of our souls. And furthermore, we learned the promise of the reward of those who sacrifice for the kingdom to follow Jesus. I think that's a, a testimony that a lot here at Red Mace Fellowship could identify with. We've got to experience God by just being here. And in, in us arriving in St. George. It's an exciting time to be at Red Mesa Fellowship. And so what's our encouragement? You know, I, I've, in my studies throughout the years and, and uh, pursuit of Christ, as I have been a Christian, you see these heroes of Scripture, you know, David, Paul, and you see their attitude. And you're like, man, that is an attitude. I mean, how can Paul get beat? for following Christ, thrown out of the city, and before the wounds and everything else heals, throws his garment back on, heads right back in to do the very thing that he got kicked out there in the first place. I mean, now you look at that and you go, God, I, don't, I couldn't do that. I mean, that's good for him, good for him. High five to Paul, but could I do that? You know, that, and making the decision to come here, you know, that was probably on the forefront of my mind, you know, to do, make the decision to come down here to plant a church in a system that is real, real similar to the system that we just saw here, you know, in a lot of ways. Could I endure that? Could I endure that kind of persecution? I'm not saying he was, you know, I thought I was going to get beat when I come down here and thrown out, but, but, you know, I mean, difficult times, right? And I don't think that word endure, I mean, he endured, but I don't think that really captures the driving point of what we're going after here, that worth that we find in Christ. He did endure, but I think Paul, in his understanding of how worthy Christ is, embraced those kind of trials and those kind of challenges. I mean, because how else can you say he did it with joy? He didn't go skipping into town, but to say he enjoyed it, he embraced it. Because that's the kind of attitude you have to do to, to do something like that. 
And the promise here, the encouragement here, is that we have a promise right here from God. Jesus himself, that we'll receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. That's an encouraging thing. That's an exciting thing. You know, so I'll leave, I'll leave you with this. So, so to echo Paul in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God, in Christ Jesus. That's our attitude. That's what we do. We press on for the surpassing worth of knowing who Christ is. That's the goal. And we have our plans and we have our, our ideas and things like that. And that's good, but God directs our steps. Our pursuit is for Jesus. Our pursuit is to see his glory. And all these things will be added unto us. You know, that's the encouraging thing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, this is an exciting time to be a part of what it is that you're doing here in St. George, Lord. Lord, as we go out throughout the week and we, um, we deal with the struggles and the trials of this life, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would bring to the forefront of our minds the surpassing worth of knowing you, Lord. Lord, that you would be present with us throughout the week, encouraging us through your word and through, through fellowship of one another, Lord. I just pray that you would continue to bless this endeavor of yours. Lord, for your glory, we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.